and, and because Khabib also now, I mean, let's remember, he's he's had a decent career. He's earned some decent money. But of course, Saturday night would have by by far and large his biggest payday. And you know, he got two million guaranteed pay per view. Uh, we're yet to see how much, but I'm going to speculate that he'll probably make another seven or eight, maybe. So he might be walking away with ten million dollars from that fight. Okay, I'm pretty sure that goes a long way in Dagestan. And he doesn't have a flash lifestyle either. But that's not the reason why I think he'd turn it down. I, I think Khabib might not want to be associated with all that negativity again. You know, because he is yeah. a person that holds himself and carries himself in high regard. And he was talking about retiring a couple of years ago pretty early. And and I don't know if he'd want to go through all that again. May, you know, not because of the fight. He might take the stance of, I proved my point. I beat him down. I beat him into submission. Or chapter in life together is over now hmm. but who knows money talks yeah i i think that that's all fine and dandy until you are you have the title they put the options in front of you and you can go all right i can go and handily beat connor again for you know probably twice as much money the next time around he's gonna make more but rematches are always bigger this would be fucking huge right or I can go fight somebody like Tony Ferguson, which is a way trickier fight. Way, way trickier fight. Way more way tools to be. Way trickier fight. We just watched Tony Ferguson fucking you know, smash Anthony Pettis in a, with an awesome performance. Really, I think Tony Ferguson is not great on interviews. I feel like he's his his words are working faster than his head. I feel like I always I like Tony a lot, but I feel like he always misses the mark when he's trying to talk shit in those interviews. But he's a fucking killer. But I'm talking about, you know, who... That has to be sold over and over again. Tony has to be sort of like sold to you as the dude, even though he was the dude, legitimately the dude. They took away that interim title from him. You know, why wouldn't you take the easier fight for substantially more money? What In what world wouldn't you do that? I, you know. I agree. I agree. Now, let's talk about Tony Ferguson a little bit because, um, and I don't think you'll mind me saying this. He texted me last week and uh, said, you talking shit about me on your podcast? Well, I'm out here working. Thanks. And I texted him back. I said, when was I talking shit? I said, please explain. Now, obviously, we say a lot of things on this podcast, and a lot of the time it's tongue-in-cheek and we're busting balls. But I actually, you know, listen, Tony is a unique character. He is. And I think that's fair to say, you know. Um, what was he talking about? I don't think been particularly – I, he, he didn't respond. I, I, I texted him back again and he didn't respond. We talked about it Saturday night though. We had a quick chat and he was fine with it. And as I said, I, I don't recall ever being disrespectful to Tony on here. We might have been have some have some fun like we do about everybody. I think you've but, been nothing but complimentary about his fighting. His, yeah. I think maybe the only thing, I think you just said he's strange at times. Maybe something like that. Yeah, well, well you know, he, he's a unique cat, you know, and good for him. But what I want to talk about is for Tony Ferguson, I, I thought what he did on Saturday night was incredible. I really did. I mean, for him to uh, blow out his knee, I forget the exact injury, but it was really bad. He had to have a re complete reconstructive surgery, a cadaver put inside his knee. To come back just under six months, and not to mention that's that's not just the uh, the rehab time. That's training for a fight as well. That's doing a fight camp, recovery in a fight camp, all within six months. Um, to have his lightweight interim title stripped, for pretty much no apparent reason. He won that belt fair and square and he injured himself and they took it from him. So he had a chip on his shoulder all week. And you know what? I understand. He probably felt that like the organization was against him. He had his title stripped off him. The world kind of thought, oh, forget, forgot about him and just focused on Khabib versus Connor. Whilst he's the co-main event on that card, but he got no headlines. He got no headlight. Sorry, no, no headlines. There was no spotlight on him. You know, so so I understand him being worked up, emotional, aggressive with the media. And he went out there Saturday night and put on an amazing performance. The fight was incredible. Props to Anthony Pettis as well. Anthony Pettis was sensational as well. It was a great fight and should both be very proud. But after well, the fight, Ferguson was on the ground and he was very, very emotional. And Eddie Bravo was talking to him and giving him words of encouragement. And I totally get it. I totally got it. And that was the truest moment we'd seen from Tony Ferguson, that raw emotion. And that just, just to go back to Khabib, that's the kind of emotions 
that fights bring out in people, especially in fighters. If you've never been through a fight camp, if you've never had the isolation, the preparation, the dedication, the, the, the wear and tear on your body, the, the, the repetition of sparring every day, getting beat up, not being able to eat food, and then seeing online everyone talking shit, reporters not giving you the fair crack of the whip. You know, it's, it's a lot of emotion. And we saw Tony break down the emotions, got a bit too much of him for a moment. And we saw Khabib snap as well yeah. because this is highly charged fucking stuff. There's, no, there's nothing else in this world that will bring out more emotions than a, a real fight. You know what I'm saying? That's a great fucking point. And, you know, not to mention the fact that at the core of it, your life is on the line. The You don't really know, no matter how confident you may say you are, you know, you don't really know what's going to happen. It's such a, a an intense sport where at any second you can get knocked out, choked out, whatever it is. And the reality is people have died in the sport. You know, having all of that weigh on you you know, it is like really, really heavy. And I've only seen a glimpse of that. And I, I be, be, being friends with you is, uh, is to be, in my opinion, the, the biggest experience I've sort of experienced with that because I watch what you go through and, and, you know, what you put, you know, everybody through your family. It's a lot. It's a really, really intense thing. And I agree with you about Tony as well. I think that was one of the better moments that we've seen from Tony. And the only thing I've ever been critical with Tony on is I feel like I, once we saw Connor sort of, turn into Mr. Fucking Swagger. It seemed like Tony saw that and was like, oh, well, I have to sort of do that sort of thing in order to kind sure. of get attention. Whereas Tony doesn't come off like it's, when he puts a sunglass on, he's coming off like a cocky dick. It doesn't seem like that's who he is. We've interviewed Tony on the radio show before. Um, yep. And it was a, a, just a fairly nice guy. So, yeah, it's, um, what do you but think? But you know, of fighters often have alter egos. And as you say, I think that's a, a pretty good, um, example of that when you put the glass when he puts the glasses on, he becomes that guy. You know, may maybe when he's in the octagon afterwards with his team or when he's with his family, I'm sure he's not that guy. You know, that like rampage. You know, used to say when when he was fighting, he he became rampage. He became somebody else. That's why he would walk out and howl. You know, because he'd become this different person. You know, and mm. he try and harness that person to help him in his fights. So we do see that. You know, it's a difficult thing. Um, anyway. Congrats, Tony Ferguson. Congrats to Anthony Pettis. I thought he looked sensational. He really did. Shame I, about what happened to his hand. Is it crazy for me I to... Think, go on. Well, I was going to say, I, I'm just kind of going like... I don't want to hear that a guy broke his hand he doesn't want to continue because he broke his hand. Only because I've heard of so many guys that break their hands and continue with a broken hand. Like, okay. you hear, Wasn't there a guy earlier in the night who broke both of his hands and he still won? I'm glad you said this. I'm glad you said this because I was... Because Callum... My son, for those that don't know, asked the same thing. Um, and I was just about to say, prior to you saying that, I think we need to take a second to uh, recognize what a great cornerman, Pettis' cornerman, Duke Rufus, was on Saturday night. I thought he was fucking outstanding. And I talked about this on the post-fight show as well. A lot of fighters, they're trainers. A lot of them, they try and make it about them. You know, they, they, you see them jockeying for position to make sure they're on camera. You mm. see when they're walking into the fights, they, they want to be seen. They they, they 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 try and steal the limelight and a lot of them are there for themselves. They're not there. And they're, of course they're there for the fighter, but they're trying to get as much exposure and they're trying to get paid. You know, sometimes they're not putting the fighter's best interest at heart. They're like, no, go on, go out there for the last round. You can do it. You might be able to win because then the fighter gets the win bonus and he might get a fight of the night bonus. And then that means their percentage might be a little bit higher or they can get some more money out of him. And I'm telling you, that sounds like an ugly thing to say. But in the lower level, guys, that's how it fucking is. I'm telling you now, in the world of mixed martial arts, there's some great people. But in the world of fight sports generally, there's a lot of fucking scumbags and low lives as well. Whether it's coaches, fighters, trainers, managers, there's good and bad all over the place. Mm. And the fight world brings out the best of the good and the best of the bad. I'll fucking tell you that right now. Entertainment. There's some real fucking scumbags out there. But hold on. So at the end of the third round, third or second round, Duke Rufus said, how's your hand? And he said, my hand's broke. My hand's broke. Here's why it wasn't smart to go out there the third round. You're right. If it was just a broken hand, then maybe. But he just seen Pettis, you know, only just make it out the second round. 
leaking blood from everywhere. Mm. He'd had a fucking good hiding for two rounds. Yeah, he had a big moment in the second round where he dropped Tony Ferguson and nearly finished him. But Tony took it and came back and started putting it on Pettis again. He was losing that fight pretty dominantly, but he, he did have some big moments. But he was already losing, already getting beaten to a pulp, already covered in blood. And now I want you to go out in the third round with one hand and try and win. All that was going to happen was Pettis would have taken further damage. And he might have got injured out there. He might have lost vision. He might have lost an eye. He might have lost his life. Who fucking knows, right? And Duke Rufus was like, hold on a minute. You're losing this fight. And now, you, now you've got a broken hand. There's All no path to victory. Take, there's no path to victory. You're going to take five more minutes of fucking damage that could take years of your career, could end your career. It could beat the fight out of Anthony Pettis and have him thinking, I never want to experience that again and therefore retire. It's just no good for anyone. And I thought that was very selfless. And it was very, it was a beautiful thing what he did. I thought it was incredible. That's a really, that's a really astute point. And I, I think that it's something that the fans would never even consider. Because I was looking at it, I was going like, really, a broken hand? But when you consider there's no, there's nothing he could do to come back in that fight. The fact that he had the broken hand, you go like, all right, well, now it's actually impossible. You're not even going to be able to knock him out. You're not going to be able to land that fucking big shot. Um... It is a really interesting point, and maybe we take it for granted as fans. Sometimes when you're, when you don't know the guy personally, or you don't have any sort of relationship, or you don't really have a horse in the race, you sit there for and go sure. like, "Oh, come on, really Listen, for a broken hand?" Yeah. As a fan, you want to see the fight continue. That was yeah. a fucking great fight. I was loving it. Okay, it was it was seventy percent all Ferguson, thirty percent Pettis. Pettis did drop him and followed it up nicely, but Ferguson recovered. It was a great fight, and as a fan, you want to see it continue. But when you're close to the situation and you know the person, you've trained him since he's a fucking kid, right? And this is his life and soul. This is how he pays the bills. And the reality of what you're seeing as a coach is that unfortunately you just outmatched tonight, and maybe on another night you might get him, but. Given the narrative of what just happened over those last 10 minutes, you've been beaten, you're covered in blood, you've had the shit kicked out of you. Yeah, you're fighting, you know, you, you can hold your head up high because you landed some good shots and, you know, but the writing's on the wall. And it he was Duke thing. who stopped it. It wasn't It wasn't Anthony who uh, called no, for it. No, it was stopped. Duke. It, it was Duke. 